Space Society has the great privilege of uh, having uh, a speaker for their closing remarks. Today, uh, Martin Harwit uh, is the director of the National Air and Space Museum. Before coming to the Smithsonian Institution in August 1987, he served a variety of positions at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, including chairman of the astronomy department, professor of astronomy, and co-director of the history and philosophy of science and technology program. Let me say that again. History and philosophy of science and technology programs. His research interests include observational astronomy, theoretical astrophysics, and the history of astronomy and astrophysics. Martin was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia in 1931. He received a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1960, all in the field of physics. He has published three books on astrophysics and astronomy and is the author of more than 170 articles on scientific subjects. He also holds a number of patents for technical innovations. Let's uh, welcome Martin Harvey. Uh, I think a number of you were, I'm going to speak without a uh, microphone. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, many of you were here in the last couple of hours and uh, heard a number of really interesting remarks by, among others, uh, John Egan, who was talking about uh, space work and uh, business and their interrelationships, and John Miller, who talked about forging liaisons between space work and science. And I'm going to come back to those topics because I think they're very uh, relevant to the whole question of discovery. <coughs> Scientific discovery, astronomical discovery, does not take place in a vacuum. It takes place uh, as part of a societal program, a, a program that's based on human interest, human curiosity, and a wish to understand more about the universe and uh, its origins and, and the origins of life. And so, as I talk about the uh, discoveries that we've made over the last few decades in astronomy, in this next half hour, uh, I'm going to be coming back to the conditions that made these discoveries possible and then look at what the future holds and whether discoveries of the kind that we've made uh, earlier in the century are going to be possible with the space program that we see ahead of us now. Uh, perhaps we could lower the lights a little more to be able to see these slides. Um, what you see here is a, a slide which shows you roughly what the sky looks like when you um, when you look with your naked eye. And I don't know whether there's a pointer here anywhere. Um, if not, I'll sort of point with my with the, my finger as much as I feel it's possible. Someone has a pointer, it might be a, Oh, thanks a lot. That's great. Um, you notice, for example, that there's a little pink star up here. Uh, when you look at it under greater magnification and better image resolution, you see that it looks like a roiling cloud of gas. That's the Andromeda Nebula. It's not a star at all. And what's happened here is that we've replaced the eye by a telescope, and then all of a sudden, we see with much greater clarity, we have much better picture resolution. And we'll see as I go along that much of what we've been able to discover in astronomy and discover about the universe has been hinged, very tightly coupled, to the availability of instrumentation that has made it better to see more clearly in one way or another. Uh, we know of all kinds of uh, objects, uh, all kinds of phenomena in the universe. Here's a comet, for example. That's part of a, that's a body that we find floating around the solar system. Uh, we find planets in the solar system. Here's one, uh, Jupiter, that we see not as we would see it from Earth, but the way that we can only see it from a spacecraft looking down from the pole. You see part of the dark side of the planet. You see the equatorial red spot uh, from the poleward direction. Uh, when you go out further into 
the universe, you see clusters of stars like the Pleiades here, which contain stars, dozens of stars perhaps, that are like our sun, only much brighter in some cases, much bluer. Uh, when you go out further, you see clouds of gas and dust intermixed with stars. Uh, you go out even further, you see globular clusters like this one here, which contain 100,000 stars, like, just like the sun. Sometimes a million stars like the sun. These are, there are about a thousand of these that populate our galaxy, the Milky Way. And uh, as you go out, uh, out of the Milky Way, you find that they're twins to our galaxy. And in fact, not just a few, but something like a hundred billion galaxies that populate the universe as far as we can see, uh, as far as the horizon or uh, galaxies are receding at speeds that are comparable to the speed of light, and we can't see any further. So there are 100 billion of these galaxies. Each of these galaxies has 100 billion stars, just like the sun. Some of those may have planetary systems like ours. Some of those planetary systems may house life. We don't know. We want to find out. If you go even to larger objects in the universe, larger clusterings, larger aggregates, you find the very largest ones are clusters of, of galaxies, uh, just like uh, this one here, uh, where you find all kinds of odd-shaped <coughs> galaxies, these pretzel-shaped ones, ones that are linear, some that are globular. Uh, but these are the very largest single objects that you can find. And these contain about a thousand galaxies apiece. And then there are comparable holes or voids, which uh, are places in the universe where there could have been galaxies, but there's nothing. Uh, we don't see anything at all. And those voids are comparable in size to these, to these clusters, <laughs> actually somewhat bigger. Now, this kind of a view of the universe has been all optical. I've shown you things that you can see photographically, but that's not the only aspect of the universe that we've been discovering. In fact, most of the discoveries that we've made over the last few decades have been outside the range of optical astronomy. Uh, for example, you see a tiny looking galaxy here, the little red spot in the middle. That's a galaxy containing 100 billion stars. What you see here is an image that has been obtained at radio wavelengths by photographic techniques that, that use radio telescopes and arrays of radio telescopes to register the, uh, the radio waves that we come in, and then you artificially construct a false color image like this. And coming out of that tiny red spot are these huge clouds of electrons and protons that are moving at the speed of light and spiraling around intergalactic magnetic fields to form these puff clouds that, that radiate radio waves uh, on both sides of it. And we find that there are many, many other kinds of radio objects out there in the universe which have no optical counterparts at all. And some of the greatest discoveries that we've made, some of the greatest insights that we've gained about the universe over the last four or five decades since World War II have been through radio astronomy. Similarly, we've gained also a great deal of insight through X-ray astronomy, where we now have a view of the celestial sphere, which is uh, shown in this plot here, with all kinds of different types of X-ray emitting sources, which at optical wavelength look like ordinary stars, ordinary galaxies, but actually at X-ray wavelengths are found to have an energy budget, an outflow, an outpouring of energy at X-rays, which is much, much greater than the total budget of optical wavelength to which the light can respond uh, in the energy regime. So before we had X-ray astronomy, before we had radio astronomy, we would see these galaxies and we would think that they looked rather odd we would have no idea that something like 10 or 100 times the budget of energy that we saw pouring out at optical wavelength 
actually came out at radio waves or x-rays and that we had totally underestimated the physical processes that were going on in these objects and therefore had no way of physically coming to comprehend them. Now, what are some of the lessons that, that we can learn from these discoveries? Well, one of the interesting things is that I mentioned to you before, I showed you that picture of the, of the Orion Nebula looking to the naked eye like a pink star, but to a telescope uh, showing roiling gases that, that were uh, activated uh, by stellar energy. And what I'm showing here is a number of successive frames uh, of a scene seen at radio wavelength. In the top left-hand part of the uh, slide here, you see a map of a radio source, and there's a very bright point in it. Well, you want to see what that bright point is, so you take a small fraction, which I've shown in a frame, and you blow it up into what you see on the top right. And you still see a, light, a bright blob there. So you take that blob and draw a frame around it, and then you expand that a factor of 10, and you get another map. And you take, but that still has an unresolved bright blob in it. So you take a little rectangle around that, and you blow that up another factor of five in each direction. And you still see that there's a part in there which it looks point-like and which you can't resolve. So you blow it up again, and you blow it up another time. And by the time you have blown this picture up uh, that many times in a row, you have a picture resolution which is about 100,000 times better than what you initially had. And you still see parts that are unresolved there. Now, astronomy has made great strides by successively being able to get down to finer and finer pictorial detail. And it has also made great strides by getting down to finer and finer color resolution, wavelength resolution detail. And by doing that, we've discovered new types of sources that just have quite, quite different properties. And let me give you an example of that in a diagram which is fairly complicated. This is a diagram which uh, represents the history, in a way, of technological advances that we've seen over the last few decades. <coughs> now, what I'm plotting here on this scale is the picture resolution. The higher the number, the better our capability of getting pictorial information. Essentially, you're putting the universe under a microscope and getting more and more detail. And the numbers here give you the amount of detail that you can get out of a picture. What you see plotted here on the uh, bottom scale is the wavelength of the radiation. Radio waves over here, infrared wavelength, visible light, a very narrow band, ultraviolet rays, x-rays, and then gamma rays, increasing in energy from the right to the left. Now, the different colors that I show here, different shades of green, represent the technological capabilities that we have at different epochs. In 1939, we only had capabilities at optical wavelengths and a little bit of infrared or heat-seeking uh, technology. And Carl Jansky at Bell Labs had done a little bit of radio work in 1932 and had discovered that there was a hiss coming from the center of the galaxy, but that's all we knew. By virtue of World War II and radar developments, by 1959, this lighter shading of green, a medium green, we had been able to start looking at the universe at radio wavelength, and we had fairly coarse image capability. A hundred corresponds to roughly what the eye can see. It's about a minute of arc resolution. A little bit, a little bit uh, actually a thousand would be about what the eye can see on this scale here. Uh, and by virtue of the rockets that had been developed in World War II, we were able to take ultraviolet seeking and sensing equipment above the atmosphere and start seeing at very coarse images things like the sun and maybe some of the brightest stars. 
By 1979, we had capabilities across the entire spectral range, not very high angular resolution or very high picture resolution, except here in the visible range and here in the radio wavelength range. Now, what have we discovered? Well, this little triangle here corresponds to the discovery of quasars in 1960. Quasars are extremely compact, star-like looking radio sources. All the radio sources that we've discovered with World War II technology before that had been diffuse blobs in the sky. And then all of a sudden we saw something which was point-like, stellar in appearance, and we didn't know what to call them. But it was obvious that it was different from anything we'd ever seen before, and so we called them quasi-stellar objects, and that was then contracted to quasars. Those were discovered in 1960 with technology that had not yet been around in, 19, in 1959. So it's in this light green part, but not in the part that had been capable of observing in 1959. And then if you go up here, another factor of 10,000 in picture resolution, you find that uh, we found something called superluminal sources. Um, objects in the universe that seem to be expanding faster than the speed of light, although that's an optical illusion, again discovered in 1971 with techniques that were not available a decade earlier. And in fact, with picture resolution, that was 10,000 times better than what you'd had in 1960. And you come over here and you see X-ray stars and X-ray galaxies discovered respectively in 1962 and in 1966, again with technology that had not been available in 1959, only seven years earlier. There are a couple of things I want to point out to you here. One, that the evolution of technology was very rapid. Two, that as the technology evolved, we discovered totally new phenomena that had never been seen before. We'd never seen an X-ray star. We'd never seen a galaxy that emitted 100 times as much X-rays as optical radiation before. In fact, we'd never seen any X-rays from any galaxy until 1966. So as the technology evolved, we also made new discoveries. And it wasn't just that the technology had to evolve a little bit. These numbers go up by a factor of 10 every notch. And by the time you get up to the top, you're 10 billion times as powerful in your instrumentation as you're at the bottom here. And so what you see is that these discoveries, which are marked by little symbols here, different color, little symbols on the plot, are removed from each other, either in wavelength or in picture resolution capability, by factors of 1 to 10,000 technological capability. So to make an astrophysical discovery, you had to improve technology in one way or another by a factor of 10,000, of 1 to 10,000. Now you notice that there are lots of white parts here where we have no capabilities. And then there are some lines here which uh, tell you that there are physical laws that limit your ability to make better observations. If you distribute all of your telescopes across the entire Earth, uh, you can get picture resolution which just about hugs this line. If you want to do better than that, you've got to deploy your instruments over the whole solar system to get a baseline which gives you enough triangulation to, to get into ferrometric techniques to give you the picture resolution that you need. And corresponding to that, of course, going from the lower line to the top line, there are big costs uh, factors involved. And that sort of harks back to some of the uh, questions I'll come back to at the end of this uh, talk, namely the cost that is involved in astronomy today and in, in making astronomical and astrophysical discoveries. Now, what about these wide areas, though? Well, uh, when I've done this study and, and published a book on it called Cosmic Discovery about a decade ago, NASA took a look at some of those things and decided, well, they wanted their spacecraft to go into these new areas here where we don't have any capabilities yet, get above those areas by a factor of at least 100 or 1,000 if possible, 
and then make the new discoveries that we would be able to hope for. Those discoveries are not guaranteed, but on the other hand, if you don't go a factor of a thousand or so beyond where you are at the present, you're pretty sure that you will not make a new discovery. Well, here we have, for example, the Gamma Ray Observatory, which was just launched within the last year and is already finding some phenomenally interesting new subjects. Uh, the Advanced X-ray Astrophysics Facility, AXAT, which is on the drawing boards now and already cutting metal, is that kind of a, uh, of, of a uh, spacecraft also. And the Hubble Space Telescope, which hadn't been launched yet at the time that this slide was made. So there are a lot of different discoveries that are being made. COBE, which we've just been reading about in the newspapers in the last couple of weeks, uh, covered this blank area down here that had, had been missed previously and has been looking back at the beginnings of the universe and telling us about the very first billionth of a second and what was going on there. So those are lessons well learned and what we need to do if we want to keep on making astrophysical discoveries <coughs> is to try to get this uh, terra incognita filled with technological advances. Now this is only in picture resolution, but you can get the same sort of thing with spectroscopic resolution. How finely you can uh, cut up the wavelength band to see such things as the earmarks of atoms or molecules, um, as we do in chemical spectroscopy, uh, to, for example, discover, as we did, masers that exist in inter interstellar spaces, and those were discovered in 1965. Uh, to discover infrared galaxies, as we did in 1970, and many other uh, and many other interesting discoveries. And again, what NASA has been doing has been to plan spacecraft that are going to be like Fuse, for example, the far ultraviolet space explorer, that would give you a factor of a thousand in the ultraviolet, or maybe even ten thousand in resolving power. Now, what are some of the elements that are common to all of these discoveries? Well, first off, I just mentioned before that most discoveries come very quickly after you have made, uh, after the instrumentation has been brought into existence. Uh, this plot it d divides discoveries into those that were made before 1954 and those that were made between 1954 and 1979, a 25-year period. And you find that even before 1954, when the pace of discovery was rather slower, many discoveries were made in less than five years after the instrumentation that was necessary for that discovery to be made was introduced into astronomy. And between 1954 and 1979, virtually all the discoveries were made with instrumentation that was younger than that. You ask yourself, well, what happens to these instruments? Do they become totally useless after five years if you make all of the discoveries immediately? The answer is no, but their usage is changed. These instruments then become analytical instruments so that the X-ray telescopes that made the first discoveries of X-ray galaxies and X-ray stars now are used to analyze new discoveries that are made, for example, at infrared wavelength. So if we see a new object, a new kind of a source, a new phenomenon that we've never seen before uh, through the infrared satellite IRAS, then we go with the X-ray telescopes we have and we look at this, these new objects and we try to see what do they look like at X-ray wavelengths, what do they look like at radio wavelengths. And after we've made those, discover, uh, those measurements, we're then able to put all those data together and start working on a physical model which can explain what these objects are like, how they are powered, what their source of energy is, how they originated, uh, what they can tell us about the structure and evolution of the universe. So we need new instrumentation, new technological advances, but who makes those? Well, it used to be that before, especially before 1954, in the decades, uh, the centuries between Galileo and 1954, that most of the discoveries were made by astronomers, only, only a few by physicists. In recent times, virtually all the discoveries have been made by physicists. 
Um, and that is because technology in other areas has developed. Many physicists uh, had, in the years following World War II, uh, innovated powerful instrumentation in the laboratories, decided that they would like to take those instruments to a telescope because maybe by looking up at the, at the sky or putting these telescopes, uh, putting these instruments into a rocket and taking them up above the atmosphere, that maybe we would discover new things. And so, by and large, in recent times, it's been the physicists who have been introducing the new instrumentation and then by virtue of that introduction, also making the first discoveries and coming in uh, with the interesting new phenomena. So for example, Panzius and Wilson, who discovered the microwave background radiation, which has now been reanalyzed with the COBE satellite, were at Bell Laboratories. They were from the communication industry. Um, there are a number of rules that one finds if you go back to see where that instrumentation came from. The role of the military or communication equipment is almost universal in modern times in all of the discoveries. I already mentioned wartime radar, but the infrared instrumentation that has been at the forefront of most of the recent discoveries are all hand-me-downs from the military. Uh, whenever the military got a better set of infrared detectors and was getting rid of the previous generation, astronomers were eager to snap them up and to uh, point those detectors at the, at the sky and make new discoveries. So virtually all of the radio discoveries, all of the x-ray discoveries, the gamma ray, gamma ray for example, there's something called gamma ray bursters uh, that we discovered in 1973, or at least published in 1973. These are odd things we still don't understand 25 years later. Um, a burst of gamma rays will come and last for about 10 seconds from some arbitrary part of the universe. We don't know where. It'll last 10 seconds, then nothing for maybe another two weeks. Then another burst from some other direction, unpredictable. Again, lasting five or 10 seconds. These gamma ray bursts were first seen with the VILA satellites, which were satellites put in orbit in the late 1960s by the United States to detect surreptitious bomb bursts that the nuclear bomb bursts that the Soviets might be uh, exploding. We wanted to see whether there were such bomb bursts going on somewhere. We launched these gamma ray satellites, which would have seen the gamma rays given off by those bombs. Instead of seeing any surreptitious bomb bursts, we discovered these, um, these gamma ray bursts. For a long time, they were classified, even though they were first seen in 1969, 68, 69. We didn't publish the results in the open literature until 1973 because this was a, a national secret. Then it was published, but as I said, we still don't know. We know it's a new phenomenon. It could be within our own galaxy, which would be a very powerful uh, explosion giving rise to these gamma rays, or it could be out in the universe, in which case it would be an unimaginably large explosion. We still don't know what it is. Uh, the Gamma Ray Observatory will help us find out. Half the discoveries were by pure luck as with the gamma ray uh, bursts, for example. Uh, half of them, however, made, were made with instrumentation that was under the sole control of the discoverers. Now, this is interesting because, for example, Penzias and Wilson had a telescope, and they made this discovery of the microwave background at Bell Labs. Nowadays, we're going towards national laboratories where individual scientists can only get two or three hours on a given night, and then maybe no more observing time for another uh, few months, by which time that portion of the sky no longer is seen, and they have to wait a year to come back and see whether something extraordinary that they saw the first time around might just be uh, a fluke of the instrument where something was misbehaving, or whether it's really something that is a major discovery. Well. Um, what I want to end up with is to show you how rapidly the accumulation of discoveries has taken place since Galileo first discovered that there were moons around other planets back in 1610 
and the accumulation of discoveries has gone up very, very quickly, uh, almost going up at a neck-breaking pace in the last few decades. Will this continue? The answer is no, because normally, whenever we make a series of discoveries, for example, when we were discovering all kinds of new life forms on Earth, or when we were discovering, ever, discovering new continents uh, during the age of exploration, when we were discovering the Americas and exploring Africa, uh, we find that discoveries tend to go up first slowly, then as a new population comes in, seeing that this is a, an interesting field, it rises rapidly, things become more difficult, as they become more complex, you, you sort of skim the cream, it becomes more and more expensive to make discoveries. Uh, you get a downward uh, swing as people lose interest because things are too expensive, there's not enough room for a lot of people to come into the field, and slowly sort of tails off, but keeps on going. And I think this is the sort of history that astronomy is going to take, and it talks back to the kind of discussions that we heard in the last uh, uh, couple of hours before this. And if, if you go back to what John Eagle said, Eaton said about uh, having a fixed budget and working with a zero-sum game, then you sort of look at what we see looking into the future from today. And you look here 5, 10, 25 years into the future, and you find that right now you have a lot of firm commitments for space work. X-ray astronomy is doing well, you want to continue it. And you've already told people that there's going to be an X-ray, an advanced X-ray astrophysics facility, and you're pouring in 20, 30 million dollars a year into building that up, and before long you have to put a bill for about a billion dollars. That's a firm commitment, and it goes out and slowly declines as you look into the future the firm commitments go down. But there's also anticipated continuation of current research, which, which is productive, and you know it's going to be there. You have good people in the field. There's movement. There are new discoveries being made. New instruments are coming in. It's a healthy community. So you anticipate that the expenditures for X-ray astronomy are not going to go down very fast, maybe diminish slowly over the lifetime in uh, the field, productive lifetime of people who are currently in the field. Maybe another 25 years into the future you might slowly decline. So the margin that you have for new uncommitted funds for new ventures into perhaps neutrino astronomy or gravitational wave astronomy or some other space venture uh, look very marginal at the moment. Maybe you might have 5% of your margin for starting really new projects. That expands out into the future so that your commitments are down to about 50%, 25 years ahead of time, and you might decide you'll start something which will grow and fill this gap slowly over the next 25 years. But if it's a zero-sum game, you can't do much more. If you have a program that grows at the same rate as the gross national product, uh, which in sort of medium years has been about 2.5% annual growth rate, then you can assume that astronomy and astrophysics and the discovery rate can also grow over a 25 year period at a 2.5% annual rate compounded. And then it, things go up, but again the margin for uncommitted funds tends to be quite low. Now, the reason why that's important is because Initially, after the war, it wasn't very expensive to do astronomy. Um, it became more and more expensive as time went on. Each year, each two years, the expense doubled as people came up with more and more ingenious things that they could do. And the amount of money to be spent never was very large on the basis of the national budget. But over the last decade, X-ray astronomy, infrared astronomy, radio astronomy, all have reached um, the hundred million or billion dollar mark. 
just as the Human Genome Project has reached the billion dollar mark, and the Superconducting Super Collider has reached and exceeded the billion dollar mark. The Hubble Space Telescope was about two billion dollars. The Advanced X-ray Astrophysics Facility is going to be maybe one and a half billion dollars. Uh, we are talking real money now. And so we can't keep on expanding at the rate that we were expanding before when we were not playing the zero-sum game because, because the amounts of money that we were talking about were so minuscule in comparison to, say, the defense budget or human welfare budget and so forth. And so I think that as we look to the future, so we're going to have a curve that is more like this bell-shaped curve that I was showing you before. We're leveling off now because the expenses are so great. Because we're leveling off, a lot of people may lose interest and go into other fields where creativity has a better chance. Uh, we're going to keep on making discoveries even if, even if things become very expensive and the rate slows down. It just may mean that instead of making these phenomenal advances over decades, we're going to have to wait for centuries to make them. And then we're going to have to have a resolve and a mode of operating which uh, shows a greater continuity, something which in this country has always been difficult. We've always been able to do things quickly. We've ha always had a difficult time in sustaining an effort over a long period of time. And I think the main challenge in astronomical discovery, and I think the main challenge in space work as a whole, and I think this was reflected in the previous discussion, is going to be sustaining our interest and sustaining our motivation and keeping on track with the effort. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, in keeping with the theme of uh, this uh, conference, Treasures of Discovery, uh, I think Martin has really enlightened us considerably in the field of astronomy as to the recent, recent treasures of discovery. And I want to thank him very much and as being custodian uh, of our very famous aerospace museum. Uh, my friend, uh, my columns had a little bit to do with uh, putting it together. I see that it's in great hands. And uh, thank you for being a custodian of that and for coming here and sharing with us. Thanks a lot. As a chairman uh, of the board, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to uh, conclude this conference with a few observations and remarks. And uh, that's what I'll uh, set about to do right now. The creation of a spacefaring civilization, one that will establish communities beyond Earth, is a primary goal of the National Space Society. Most, if not all of us, would like to see this within our lifetime. While NSS supports many of NASA's goals, the objectives of the National Space Council and many projects of the aerospace industry, we are the only organization dedicated to the cause of settlements in space. It's the role of the National Space Society to balance our own objectives in the face of demands from what some of us call the real world. No one understood this balancing act better than National Space Society board member and visionary Tom Paine. Tom supported National Space Society because he believed in our vision and he believed in the importance of a citizen-based organization that supported a robust space program. He understood, as I do, that not all of the government's space programs deserve our support. We must evaluate these programs, those programs that could support our objectives, and do our best to make sure that they suit us. And those programs that do help create a space-faring civilization we must support wholeheartedly. In the short run, the program that best supports our goal is SEI. To the extent the space station supports SEI, we should support it too. 
Unfortunately, Tom passed away on the 4th of May this year, and uh, I was on travel when I came back. Uh, I was very disappointed because I had looked forward to meeting with him uh, uh, again. Uh, I took a little time after the uh, ceremony that we had out there on the West Coast and put together this uh, letter to the editor. I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the passing this week of Dr. Thomas O. Payne and his contributions to our country and to mankind. Tom was the administrator of NASA from 1968 to 1970, and it was during his leadership that I was a part of the first mission to land men on the moon. At breakfast on the morning of our mission launch on July 16, 1969, Tom told Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, and me that our safety was paramount, and if anything didn't look right for us to come home, and he'd see to it that we were on the next mission. Tom's vision for exploration inspired us all, all of us who participated with him in the U.S. space program, and he continued his efforts to address the issues of space exploration right up to his passing. He was a willing listener to new ideas and readily offered his help to the space community at large. In March of this year, Tom revisited his 100-year timeline for Martian pioneers, which he had originally developed in 1984. In this recent version, Tom expressed his feelings that prospects are now brighter than ever for international investment in this settlement and economic development of the inner solar system. The universal human drive will spur continuing technological advance, international cooperation, and global economic growth. His message continued with the thought that a vigorous international program to settle Mars could provide an alternative to destructive wars while improving the standard of living on all continents through the resulting advances in technology. Hopefully these words will serve as a guiding light to the world, and we will heed his message to go forward with an international effort for space exploration, including the settlement of Mars. I'd like to quote a portion of the poem, Ulysses, from Alfred Lord Tennyson that was read at Tom's memorial service, which I feel reflects his spirit of exploration. It is not too late to seek a newer world, my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. We are one equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Farewell, Tom. To end, I'd like to take you on an imaginary trip with me. I'd like each of you to think about a time when you visited an historic site. Like, let's say, the pyramids or the Colosseum or some activities associated with Columbus's voyage. Plymouth Rock, the Alamo, Kitty Hawk, or Cape Canaveral. Any place of an historic beginning. Think about the people who lived then and how they felt about the events that took place there. Now imagine that you're in a classroom or a lecture hall in a city on a planet 25 light years away from our solar system. The year is 2492. And the instructor has just asked the class to identify the original world of their human race. A holographic map of the galaxy appears in the air at the center of the class. You raise your hand. The instructor nods at you, and using the joystick attached to your desk computer, you move a flying pointer through the, sky, the stars of the galaxy and identify Sol, the sun around which the original planet Earth revolves. The instructor congratulates you, touches a button, and the hologram view zooms into this single star. You see the ten planets 
as they revolve in their orbits around it. Again, she looks at you and says, which of these planets is the Earth? You point to the third planet from the sun, and again, the view zooms in. Before you is a brilliant jewel of a world, a world with a magnificent single moon, almost a twin planet system. The beauty of this world takes your breath away. And the rest of, you and the rest of the class have, of course, seen many pictures of Earth, but you never fail to feel a sense of awe and deep reverence whenever you look at it. After a moment of silence, the instructor speaks to the class. It was only a little over five centuries ago that humanity first stepped off the planet Earth and onto another world. That world was the Earth's only moon. And looking back, the step seems to be a small one. Only 200,000 plus miles, just a little over what light travels in one second. But remember, until that time, since its earliest life, humanity was not able to leave that world. It didn't, didn't have the knowledge or the means. That moment was a most important moment in our history, the time when it became possible to explore beyond the surface of our planet Earth, to realize our destiny of bringing life to cold, empty, empty worlds, to live progressively outward in the universe. What a time to have been alive. What we wouldn't give to have been there on Earth at that time. Just think of the adventure, the vision, the sense of destiny that must have existed. What was it like to have been alive? When humanity first set foot on another world, to explore and settle the universe, and then after the pause, ventured outward again. <coughs> Those are the feelings and thoughts that countless future generations will have as they think back to the second half of the 20th century and wonder how it felt to live during that special moment in history when humanity took that first step off Mother Earth and onto another world. As Mecca is now to the Muslim and Jerusalem is now to the Christian and Jew, so Earth will be to future emigrant generations of humanity, the place from which they originated, matured, and ventured outward. You're here. We're here. This is just the beginning. Thank you. Space Society, I'd like to thank Lori Rome and her entire conference committee for this outstanding International Space Development Conference in 1992. <laughs> Lori, will you please have uh, the conference committee and staff stand up to be recognized?